the end of the Silk Road is Europe. And so Europe is really the goal. Uh, there was $700 million of Chinese investment in 2008 before the financial crisis. It's now $20 billion in 2017. Uh, the number of mergers and acquisitions were nine times uh, the value last year of U.S. mergers and acquisitions in Europe. So there's huge momentum here. What's changed is now Europeans are getting uh, uh, nervous as well. The European Commission talked about uh, China as a systemic rival. Those are tough words in Eurospeak. Uh, uh, the European Council uh, j is, uh, just broke up from its meeting with Theresa May. I have a little news from that, if you'd mm -hmm. like it. Uh, but they're going into a meeting. They'll go into a meeting tonight on what to do about China. But they're very divided because some countries just need the money more. Right. And China likes picking them off one by one because uh, it, if you compare it to Italy, it's got a 16 to 1 GDP advantage, so it has the leverage uh, in negotiating with Italy. And if, it were, if it were negotiating with the EU, it would be a smaller economy. Fred, we've talked already about the concern that Germany, for example, is floated into the to Russia's sphere of influence, about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and the way in which that might change the dynamic between Germany and the U.S. Now we have China who's making economic inroads into Italy. Again, I ask, where does that leave the vaunted U.S.-EU relationship? Well, it, it, you know, this is a time when we should be shoulder to shoulder with the European Union. Uh, and that's just not President Trump's instinct. He, he's still threatening uh, car tariffs with Germany. He doesn't like the fact that he, the reason he thinks the Europeans are so tough to negotiate with is they don't want to uh, take, uh, uh, make deals over agriculture. The French block that at every turn. But if we actually went in to negotiate with China shoulder to shoulder and you put our two GDPs together, we would be three times the size of China and we'd have real leverage. But instead of being in that position, they can actually shape the rules and standards for the future. And what we forget about is this isn't just trade. This is a question of what system, economic system, and what governance system is actually going to have the commanding heights in the, in the there, years ahead. There are a lot of examples where countries that actually accepted capital from the Chinese have been left in an even more vulnerable, vulnerable position, whether it's Pakistan or even take Sri Lanka, where it accepted a major loan from the Chinese, and when it came to actually paying the Chinese back, they came up short and were forced to give up a major port to the mm. Chinese, which is actually 110 miles away from the coast of India, a key rival to China. So that is another case where sometimes the Chinese do, in fact, try to take more than they can actually get. Yeah, we'll see what else comes of this trip. Fred, I know you flected the news also out of that EU meeting. This one with regard to Britain and to Brexit. Yeah, I'll be fast here, but it's a big deal. So Theresa May is with, was with the European Council. She wanted an extension to June 30th of the deadline, which, which is supposed to be the end of this month. And they've given her only to May 22nd. So importantly, that's the day ahead of Parliament deadline. And then only if she can ha get Parliament to pass her deal next week, which remains unlikely. And then they said they'll give a longer uh, extension, which I would favor because I think this country, uh, the UK is losing so much through Brexit, and I think a, a year's reflection could yeah. bring a referendum to turn around. But they won't give her that unless the UK participates fully in the May 23rd election. So the EU is playing hardball with May, and they've now gone into private session without Theresa May to hash, hash out this draft.